so the data is out on global energy consumption. And let me give you the good news. The good news on the upper right of this diagram is that we are making progress with clean energy technology. Renewables of all sorts, clean technologies, modern biofuels, all of those are making a dent and increasing the capacity for us to be able to get to a net zero environment. Now let me give you the not so good news. The exact same diagram where I focus just on fossil fuels, that's also growing. Our use of fossil fuels is actually 2% higher this year than it was the previous year. And this is something that energy experts have been telling us for some time now, which is that we are increasing our demand for energy across the board, largely because of population growth and economic advances. As we get more uh, 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 consumers, as we get them out of poverty and into the middle class, they're going to be consuming more energy. And all of the data centers and the GPUs that are fueling uh, the generative AI, all of those are causing us to be burning more fossil fuels, not less. So energy transition is clearly important. We all agree that we need to engage in that transition, but transition to what? In fact, instead of energy transition, many experts suggest that we ought to be focusing on energy addition. We need to be coming up with new sources of clean energy that will fuel the increasing demand for that energy. And these experts tell us that while a number of different technologies are important, there are three in particular that promise the future of virtually unlimited clean energy. And those are nuclear fission, nuclear fusion, and geothermal. Now, the problem is that all of these require new technology, sometimes called deep technology or hard technology because of the challenges involved in the complexity of the science and engineering. And the biggest challenge to all of this is something called the valley of death. Now, when I first came across this, I was wondering, what does Southern California have to do with challenges to technology? And actually, it turns out it's not a geographical location. It is the area between early stage scientific discovery and the translational process that brings those discoveries into commercial applications. And we are being challenged with funding that early stage development, and that's what the Valley of Death is all about. So the question I started asking is why? Why do we have a Valley of Death? And it turns out the Valley of Death exists in many different industries, biotechnology, energy, scale up in manufacturing, semiconductors, they all have a version of this valley of death, the missing middle, the scale-up problem. And it turns out that there is a common theme. And the common theme is increasing risk and uncertainty. Risk is the kind of randomness that you can parameterize, probability of success, statistical distributions. But uncertainty is the unknown unknowns that you can't parameterize. And both have been increasing over the last several decades, particularly in the areas of hard tech, which includes clean tech. So what do we do about that? Well, that's the area that I've been focusing on, trying to understand what do investors want in order to be able to unleash the capital that they have to be able to deal with these challenges. And so with my first year MBA students, I will give them this challenge to give them a sense of exactly what it is investors are looking for. I show them the returns of a $1 investment in four different kinds of financial securities. I don't tell them what it is or over what time period it spans. I simply ask them to pick one and only one if they were going to invest in their life savings, their grandparents' uh, retirement fund, their children's 529 college education plan. Which would you pick of these four? The green line that turns a dollar into $2. How many people pick that? Show of hands. Nobody? Okay. The red line that turns a dollar into five dollars, way more rewarding, but way more risky. Any show of hands here? I want you to remember this moment, because when I tell you what it is, you may want to call your brokers afterwards. <laughs> the blue line, the most rewarding of all, turns a dollar to eight dollars, but way more volatile. How many people would pick that? Okay, those are the entrepreneurs and hedge fund managers. Cool. And how about the black line that turns a dollar into five and a half, six dollars? Not very rewarding, but not very risky. By far the most popular choice in this and every other audience that I've shown this to. Let me tell you what you all pick. First of all, the time period goes from 1990 to 2008. That's an 18 year investment horizon. The green line is US Treasury bills, safest asset in the world. 
at least for the next few weeks. We'll see what the budget discussions <laughs> look like. But assuming that we agree to pay our bills, very safe asset, but if you put your money in that in 2008, you would have earned next to nothing and actually less than nothing because of inflation. The red line that only a handful of you picked, that's the US stock market, the S&P 500. Most of you already have that in your portfolio and if you didn't pick it, you may want to do some rebalancing, but if you did, congratulations, you would have done just fine since 2008. The blue investment is the single pharmaceutical company, Pfizer. Way more volatile, but if you put your money in that in 2008, well, double congratulations, you would have done spectacularly well since then. And what about the black line, the most popular investment of all? That is a private fund called the Fairfield Century Fund, which was the feeder fund for the Bernie Madoff Ponzi scheme, <laughs> which is why I had to stop this in 2008. Now, 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 why do I show this example? It's to illustrate an aspect of investor psychology. All of us, we all want high-yielding, low-risk investments. And that's what brought all of these unfortunate, unsuspecting investors into this Ponzi scheme. Now, in finance, we have a term that describes this tendency. It's called the Sharpe Ratio, named after Bill Sharpe, the Nobel Prize-winning economist at Stanford University. And the Sharpe Ratio is the average return of an investment above and beyond T-bills in the numerator, divided by the risk of that investment, the standard deviation of the returns in the denominator. And you can see that Pfizer has a Sharpe Ratio of 0.43, the S&P 500 has a Sharpe ratio of 0.54. And on paper, before the Ponzi scheme blew up, it had a Sharpe ratio an order of magnitude higher than both of those. That's what drew all of these unsuspecting investors into this unfortunate scheme. It turns out that over the last several decades, the Sharpe ratio of hard tech investments has been going down. Not because the numerator isn't attractive, there have been a number of really big successes in clean tech. The problem is the denominator has been going up in some cases even faster. And we gotta fix that problem. Now how do we increase the Sharpe ratio? Well, there are two ways. We either increase the numerator or we decrease the denominator. That's it. And that's what scientists and engineers and policymakers have been working on. Better science, better engineering, better organization, technology, government policy, public-private partnerships, all of those serve to increase the numerator and decrease the denominator. But the one area that hasn't been used as often, particularly in clean tech, is new financing and business models. We can actually use financial engineering to increase the Sharpe ratio. And I want to just describe a couple of examples. So one example is fusion energy. How do we use financial engineering to accelerate the progress that we're making in fusion? There's already a lot of exciting developments on the scientific and engineering fronts, but what about the financial front? I published a paper a few years ago with my MIT colleague, Dennis White, who's a nuclear engineer and a fusion expert. And in this paper, we describe the idea of a mega fund, a multi-billion dollar portfolio designed to accelerate progress in fusion energy. Now, to explain this concept, we have to start by a definition. What do we mean by fusion? Fusion means a commercially viable power plant. And this is an example of it, a tokamak using a magnetic field to hold plasma, heat it up to 100 million degrees to generate heat that turns a turbine, creates steam that generates electricity. Now that might seem like a big binary bet. Either you create a fusion power plant or you don't. But it turns out that a fusion power plant consists of a whole bunch of different components. And each of these components involves a variety of technology that has value in and of itself. For example, creating that sustained high temperature plasma requires a whole bunch of different components, the heating element, vacuum systems, plasma control techniques, and so on. Each of those pieces of intellectual property can generate value in and of itself. It is a portfolio, multiple shots on goal, diversification. When you present it to investors like this, they take notice and start getting interested because it is not just a binary bet. And so if you do the financial analysis and calculate the value of each of these component technologies, it turns out that the risks can be quite a bit lower than a simple single binary bet on whether or not fusion will or will not work. Is this enough? Not yet. If we want to raise a multi-billion dollar fund, 
there is one other big thing that needs to change. We need to take a lesson from the biotechnology industry, and in this paper that Dennis and I co-authored just a few months ago, we described what that is. There are a number of different lessons, but one of the most important is how do drugs get developed? Because that's an example of really hard tech. It turns out that instead of a single binary bet on whether a drug gets FDA approved or not, investors instead make a series of bets based upon the phased process by which drugs get developed. Preclinical, phase one, phase two, phase three approval, and then ultimately FDA license. That's a process by which very complex tech gets de-risked. And at each of these discrete milestones, the risk goes down, investors come in, they cash out, they recycle the capital, and that's really a very healthy ecosystem that has produced amazing number of drugs that we enjoy today. And not surprisingly, what happens is the sharp ratio increases step by step as you transfer one phase to the next. So what we need is the same divide and conquer approach for fusion energy and all other clean tech. We need to have a process by which you can break down this big challenge into sub-components that have clear milestones and where investors can come in and come out and where there is some independent third party that certifies that you've reached those milestones. We need a clean tech FDA, if you will, or rating agencies that provide that kind of breakdown. So let me wrap up by pointing out that, you know, we have a tendency to declare war on all of these challenges that we'd like to solve. We have a war on cancer. We had a war on drugs. And so, is that the right analogy? Because I'm not qualified to say whether or not we're winning or losing a war on those particular challenges, but as an economist, I am qualified to tell you that war is the wrong analogy because war is based upon fear and hatred. And while they move us to action very quickly, they are not sustainable. You cannot live in a state of fear and hate for very long. Greed, on the other hand, is very sustainable. <laughs> so why not put a price tag on the head of all of these great challenges? Finance doesn't always have to be a zero-sum game if we don't let it. With the right business models, the right amount of financing, and the right structures, we can do the thing that we all say we want to do and very few of us get a chance to do. We can all do well by doing good. Thank you.